This is lecture 15 for Chem 223. Today we'll be talking about atomic spectroscopy. I'm going to start this lecture off today with a slide about honey. Mm, delicious honey. I love this one of Winnie the Pooh, where he's just eating honey. <laughs> All right, so we're, let me pose a question to you. If you import some candy with honey in it from, let's say, Spain or Chile, how do you test the candy to see if it contains any heavy metals like lead or chromium? Well, the answer is you're going to light it on fire and watch it burn. But today we're going to be talking about atomic spectroscopy. And in atomic spectroscopy, we do just that. We light things on fire, we light our samples on fire, and depending on whether we're doing atomic absorption spectroscopy or atomic emission spectroscopy, we're either going to shine light through it to see if it absorbs any light, or we're going to see if it's giving off any light if it's really hot. Um, and so those are the two types of atomic spectroscopy we're going to talk about today, atomic absorption and atomic emission. Um, but more specifically, atomic spectroscopy is an analytical te technique that uses light or a mass to determine analyte composition. Um, now, we are only dealing with the techniques that use light today. We're not going to be dealing with mass spectrometry. That's the technique that uses mass. We'll get into that at the very end of the semester. But let's start talking about atomic absorption, and I'll tell you actually what it is. So in atomic absorption, what we have is some sort of fuel source, and we'll pump our sample in through here. So let's say we have a, an aqueous lithium sample. So this is a lithium sample with 0.001 molar concentration in water. We're flowing it through here. We're also flowing some methane gas in with it. So that's going to be a carrier gas that carries it up into this flame up here. Then we're going to shine a laser through it, and we're going to use a laser with a wavelength of light that perfectly matches the distance between a ground electronic state and some sort of excited electronic state. Because if you remember from uh, Chem 105 and 106, you can only absorb light that has a wavelength or that has an energy equal to the difference in energy between two states. And so we have to choose a wavelength that this lithium is going to absorb. And then, of course, it's going to absorb some amount of our laser light. And then on the other side of this flame, we'll put a photomultiplier tube in here to detect our signal. And so then we can compare absorption to concentration. And just like with UV vis spectroscopy, um, in atomic absorption spectroscopy, the absorption and concentration have the linear relationship. And so we can make ourselves a calibration curve and then determine concentrations of unknowns uh, using this technique. All right, but if we can do something similar with UV vis, why do we do this in atomic absorption? Specifically, why do we need a flame to do this? And the answer is matrix effects. So this doesn't mean that you start seeing green lines of code everywhere in some sort of nonsensical formatting language. What this means is that when you're in a solution, you have what's called a matrix, and the matrix is everything in that solution. So that's the solvent, that's the other ions, et cetera. And what those matrix effects do is cause significant changes to your ion. So let's say you have your lithium ion just sitting there. It has its electronic states where its electrons can sit, so it can jump to different atomic orbitals, right? And the distance between those atomic orbitals right now are fixed. But let's introduce some of our solvents. So let's say we have some water there. It's got this hydrogen bonding group. And this lithium is positively charged, so it's going to interact with the partial negative charge on this water. And that's actually going to change the difference, or sorry, change the distance in the energy states of the different orbitals in lithium. So now we've just altered the electronic environment of that lithium ion. We've changed the distance the electrons have to go if they're gonna move from one orbital to the other. So we've changed the amount of energy required to excite those. We've changed the absorbance wavelength. 
Now, of course, this guy can interact with it, or we can have a half dozen other ions, or sorry, a half dozen other water molecules circling this lithium ion interacting with it too. So we can have a variety of interaction environments. Um, but what we can also have is some tumbling of this water, which we do have in water, right? Liquid water, all the molecules are tumbling around. And so this guy is going to be getting closer and farther away from this lithium. Sometimes the positively charged or partially positively charged or hydrogens are going to face this lithium. And all these things, the movement of the water, the complexation with the water, whether the lithium is seeing partial positive or partial negative charges, how many partial and positive charges it's seeing, all those things are going to combine together to give you peak broadening. And that's why in UV vis, we have really broad peaks. The energy difference between two orbitals is set very exactly. And so if this was just absorption causing emit or excitation of electrons from one state to another, we should get really sharp lines. And we are still getting electrons excited from one state to the other, but in this aqueous environment where we're interacting with water in a lot of different in our scenarios, right? We have tons and tons of atoms of lithium in there. We have somewhere around Avogadro's number. Then we have all sorts of different distances between energy states for that lithium. And so this is just the simple case here. Um, but if you add other things in here, like different ions, so let's say this has lithium chloride versus lithium nitrate, etc., that lithium is going to be interacting with all of those different things. And so your matrix really plays a huge role when you're doing absorption measurements in the liquid phase. But if you send this all through a really hot flame, it actually will destroy all of these interactions. It will uh, basically turn everything into atoms. It'll vaporize your water, and then it'll break most of your hydrogen oxygen bonds as well. You'll have almost no intermolecular interactions. And so you're stuck with just the lone lithium ion again with its preset distances between um, electronic states. And that gives you really sharp peaks. And because it gives you really sharp peaks, you can analyze multiple species at once using certain devices. Now actually in atomic absorption spectroscopy, you still are only limited to looking at one species at a time, but that is for a different reason. So this is a flame AA instrument, AA of course being short for atomic absorption. And in this instrument, we have the burner head right here. So we have our gas come through carrying our sample up here into a flame. And you load your sample through this tiny little tube that you might not be able to see right here. You'll just take this tube and stick it in your sample and it will suck it up into here. And then you have a gas line th coming through here and another one coming through here. And you, if you see this green line coming down, that's your waste. And so you have other gases coming in here, carrying your sample up into this flame. And then once it's in the flame, and you have this hollow cathode lamp right here that shoots a laser across the bottom of the flame right here. And then it goes over into this side where you have your photomultiplier tube and you get your detection. All right, so a quick question about this setup is why is the burner head so wide? Why don't we just have a round head like in a Bunsen burner? Go ahead and pause the video for a second and think through that. Okay, well, the real answer is because if we have a wider head like this, then our laser is going to travel through more of the sample and have more chance to be absorbed. And so the broader you make this, the more sensitive your instrument is. Of course, there's practical limits to that because the broader you get it, the more sample it takes to get up into there. And if you'll look, these guys are coming through a very narrow neck into this burner head. And so if you want a really wide burner, you have to figure out how to get your gas to spread out really far. So this is about the optimal size for most applications. All right, now let's talk about this hollow cathode lamp really fast, talk about how it works. So this is a basic diagram of a hollow cathode lamp. It's usually housed in a quartz uh, window or a quartz casing. 
quartz is similar to glass, except quartz transmits uh, a lot more wavelengths of light. So glass often will absorb UV wavelengths or infrared wavelengths. And so we use quartz here because it just transmits more things. And then this fork right here is our hollow cathode. So a hollow cathode is made out of the material you're looking for. So let's say we're trying to analyze lithium, then this hollow cathode uh, cup or bowl here would be made out of lithium. And so right now it looks like it's a fork, and that's just because I had to draw it schematically so you could see it. It's actually a bowl, and so it will completely fill in this hole so it'll seal this right side off from the left side of this chamber. And then what we do is we apply a strong potential to the hollow cathode and then an opposite potential to our anode over here. And what that does is it causes uh, your anode to have a high positive charge and your hollow cathode to have a strong negative charge. We then fill this side of our hollow cathode lamp with some sort of ionizable gas. We'll usually use neon, sometimes we'll use argon. And you say to yourself, wait, neon is a noble gas. It's not very ionizable. And you're right. And actually that's part of why we choose it because it takes a really strong potential between this anode and cathode here to get an electron to pop off of your neon. And so we also have this insulating disc right here that keeps our cathode and anode separate. Um, but then because we have this super high potential between here, our neon is going to drift over and occasionally see this anode. And because that anode is at a super high potential, it's able to just rip an electron off of that neon gas. And when it rips that electron off of the neon, it turns it into neon plus. Now that positively charged neon ion is gonna shoot from this anode straight towards this negatively charged cathode. And because we have a really high potential between our anode and cathode, this neon ion is going to fly really fast and have a really energetic collision with that cathode. And so when it hits it, it's actually going to excite or heat up this cathode. That's going to cause the electrons in it to become excited to a higher state. And then when they relax down, they're going to emit light at a wavelength uh, specific to the absorption or emission lines of that material. And so by doing that, then we have a laser light that's perfectly in tune with this material in the gas phase. All right, if there's any questions about that, of course, feel free to let me know. Let's talk a little bit about our nebulizer here. So every nebulizer has two inlets for gas. So the picture I showed you before, it had an inlet on one side and another inlet on the other. And there's multiple designs, obviously, because these things have been around for a while. But you'll need one inlet for a fuel. This is usually some sort of highly combustible gas or a mixture of gases. And you choose your fuel to choose what temperature your flame is. So if you want a higher temperature flame, you'll pick a fuel that burns hotter. And if you want a cooler flame, you'll pick a fuel that burns a little colder. And then you have an inlet for air, and this is just to provide the oxygen for your flame. And then of course you have your analyte that gets sucked up into a tube. So let's zoom in on this, and now I'm gonna show you another design for a nebulizer. It's still the basic idea. You have two inlets, one for oxidant, which is your air, one for fuel, and then you have your sample flying in here. And inside this gray box, all of these nebulizers basically look the same. Of course, the layout is gonna be slightly different in this nebulizer than in this. But you have your oxidant coming through, and it's going to be spraying through an outer barrel, and it's going to suck your sample through an inner channel here. And then oftentimes you'll have some sort of bead or rod there. And so this sample is coming out, and it's being turned into droplets. And the purpose of this bead is actually to stop your big droplets. So smaller droplets can get carried by air currents really well and they can fly through these baffles, and these baffles are literally just plates that are in the way. And so small droplets can move with the air current and make it around these baffles and go up your sample, whereas big droplets will either collide with your beads or collide with your baffles, 
and then they'll just be a liquid that runs down to your grain and out of the instrument. And so all your small droplets will come up here and hit your flame. Why do we want to select for small droplets? Well, we want to select for these small droplets because they ionize a lot better. So it's a lot easier to boil off a small droplet than a small one. And it takes a lot less energy to atomize everything in that droplet. We're going to actually be doing some atomic absorption. Actually, that's a lie. We'll be doing some atomic emission in our lab in lab six. And for that experiment, our nebulizer is actually going to look like this. It's homemade. And so we'll just have a plastic tube here where we'll flow our air through. And we'll have our sample line coming through here. And if you look really close right here, the sample line actually stops at about the same time as our air line. And then the air will pull our sample out into a fine tip that will turn it into a, a spray full of droplets. And if we have any heavy droplets, then they can come and collide with this baffle. We've only got a single one. And then the smaller droplets can fly through here to the flame. And then in our setup, the oxygen is actually provided by the flame. And so big droplets that hit our baffle will come down here into a waste container. Now, do you need to know all of this uh, stuff on this slide? Not really, but uh, people often have questions about how our inlets actually work, so I thought I would throw that in there. All right, so flame atomic absorption has some pros and cons. Some of the pros are that it's really sensitive to alkali metals. Um, you can measure those things at really low concentrations, often parts per billion or parts per trillion if you're really careful. The problem with it though, uh, it's also really uh, cheap relative to other techniques. Some problems are that since you're using a hollow cathode lamp, you can only analyze one element at a time, and that is a big drawback. And other instruments are actually more sensitive for most other elements. Um, so let's go on to another instrument that, uh, in my opinion, is getting more and more obsolete, but it's in your book, so we will cover it. And that is the graphite furnace. So the graphite furnace is pretty small. It's only about an inch long. Uh, but this guy, what it has inside it is this little plate right here where you load your sample. If we look at it from the front, you'll see this blue plate actually has, uh, it's actually connected to the side. So this blue plate that I'm talking about right here is connected to the side. And there's this little hole right here in your graphite furnace where you can insert sample and it'll stand on that plate. And then what we do is we just resistively heat this guy. So this whole furnace is really resistive. We just run a current from one side to the other and that makes it really hot. And so as we're heating it, this thing uh, hits a point where it will boil off all of your um, solvent and other things. And so all your sample uh, will get boiled off. Let's say if we have anything on the sides of this too, if we mess up, it'll all get boiled off. And that'll actually just leave our sample or our analyte that we're looking for. And then we can boil that off at a higher temperature. And once that boils off, we will send a laser through this graphite furnace. And we'll have that laser provided by a hollow cathode lamp. Um, and we can sit on this analyte for a long time. What I mean by that is once we vaporize this and atomize it, then your sample is all just floating here as a puff of smoke in your graphite furnace chamber. Your laser then is passing through there and it can just sit on that sampling that one sample for a long time. Okay, so some pros for the graphite furnace is it's more sensitive to alkali metals than flame AA. Um, you get most of your background eliminated as well because that gets eliminated earlier. So I'm talking about your matrix there, which can still play some part in atomic uh, absorption. And your sample is present for much longer than for flame AA. So this means you can sample for longer and you use way less sample using a graphite furnace than using a typical flame AA instrument. Some cons is it's more expensive than flame AA. Uh, it's also, you can still only do one element at a time and other instruments are more sensitive, again, for most other elements. And we'll get to the really sensitive instrument 
towards the end. Another problem with the graphite furnace though is it has poor precision. So you can only get uh, about five to 10% precision on your measurements, uh, which means that you have large, large uncertainties. All right, now let's talk about atomic emission. A lot of the setup for atomic emission is very similar to atomic absorption, but we get to skip the laser step. So here again, I have my sample going into some burner. It's catching on fire and burning. But here what's going on is we usually try and get this a bit hotter than an atomic absorption. And we get it hot enough that the flame will excite our electrons to our excited states. So the flame gets all our electrons up here, and then they have some probability of relaxing and releasing photons of light. So then we just send our sample through a flame. We put a monochromator here. And so if we're looking for lithium, we'll select for the wavelength of light that lithium emits at. We'll only let that light through to hit our PMT. And then here, instead of comparing absorption to concentration, we just compare emission to concentration. And fortunately, that's also fairly linear. And so the big difference here though, uh, is that we use a much hotter flame and of course we don't use a laser. Now to get to these higher temperatures, uh, we, or to understand what temperatures we need to get to to use atomic emission, we have to turn to what's called the Boltzmann distribution. So Boltzmann was a guy that spent way too much time with numbers, but what he did was he tried to model the probability of an electron being in one state versus another. Here I am giving a key or a legend to this equation to tell you what all these variables mean. But these n's are talking about the number of electrons in each state. So let's say we're dealing with Avogadro's number of atoms, then some portion of those atoms would have their electrons in the ground state, some would have their electrons in an excited state. Now these g terms, I'll have to describe those a little bit. G in this equation is what we call the degeneracy. So degeneracy doesn't mean how negligent are you on your child support payments or have you robbed anyone lately? <laughs> degeneracy here talks about uh, how many available states are there. So for example, in an s orbital, there's only the one s, but if you're jumping to p, there's the px, the py, the pz, right? And if you're going to the d, there's the dxy, dz squared, zada, yada, yada. And so your degeneracy here is talking about how many, uh, how many states are there with exactly the same energy. And so this g value is gonna be an integer value. It's usually gonna be one, three, five, et cetera. If you get into molecules, it can be other numbers like two and four, et cetera. And then e here is just the natural e, and we're raising that to this power up here where we have negative delta E is the difference in energy between our ground and excited states. K here is Boltzmann's constant. I just got that number listed down here. And then T of course is your temperature in Kelvin. So with this equation, we can look at an emission spectrum right here. So this is a simulated emission spectrum for nickel. And it has two emission wavelengths that are showing up potential question I could give you with something like this is give you a spectrum like this and say what temperature was this measurement made at. So what you'll need to know are the intensities and actual wavelengths of these two emission lines. So down here I have all the information you'll need to know about each of these peaks and I actually have the wavelengths not recorded in wavelengths but in what's called wave numbers. So wave numbers are calculated by taking one over the wavelength. So it's very or similar to frequency, but instead of recording these in hertz, we're recording them in per centimeters. So these are almost always written in per centimeters. And the reason for that is because it's really easy to convert from per centimeters to joules. So there's a little conversion factor there. Um, and so here, what I have for you, is the wave number of each of these lines and a conversion factor there for you. I tell you whether it is a triplet or singlet state. So this species at, or sorry, this peak at 33,295 uh, per centimeters 
It is a triplet state. It has an intensity of one. And then this peak over here at 33,282 per centimeters is a singlet state and it has an intensity of 0.35. So go ahead now, I'm gonna skip a little farther for it. Go ahead now and try to solve for the temperature of that spectrum I was just showing you. You don't need to see the spectrum, you have all the information you'll need right here, and you have the Boltzmann distribution equation right here. So go ahead and pause the video now and try to work through that. All right, so this is how you'll work through that. The number of electrons in your excited state, we don't actually know the exact number of electrons, but we can figure out this ratio of electrons in the excited state to the ground state. And the way we're going to do that is just by assuming that the relative abundance of these different peaks, the relative intensities is proportional to the number of electrons in those states. So if you didn't follow that, what I said was n star is equal to one because that's the intensity of the excited state. And n naught, which is the number of electrons in our ground state, is equal to 0 0.35 because that is our intensity of uh, our ground state. And so if we take the intensities of those two states and divide them by each other, that will also give us this ratio of how many electrons are in the excited state versus how many are in the ground state. All right, what about these G values? Well, our G star, so the star here always refers to our excited state and the zero always refers to our ground state. This G star is equal to three because again, this excited state is a triplet state. So then G naught, of course, would be a one because it is a singlet state. And then our delta E, that's something we're gonna have to calculate ourselves. So the best way to do that is just to find the difference in these wave number values here, and then multiply that by the conversion factor between joules and wave numbers, and that will give us a delta E of 2.526 times 10 to the negative 20 second joules. So that seems really small, right? But something to consider is this is actually the difference in energy between two electronic states in a single atom. So we're not dealing with a mole of atoms here, we're just dealing with single atoms. And then of course Boltzmann's constant is given right here. Realizing now that you couldn't really have solved this whole thing without me showing you Boltzmann's constant, but that's okay. All right, so the question is what's the temperature here? So we're gonna have to take this equation and solve it for temperature, which means we're gonna have to divide over our degeneracy. We're then going to have to take the natural log of that and so overall, we're going to get this equation right here when we solve for T. And then from here, of course, it's just plugging things into your calculator and that can always be tricky. So make sure that you got 375 Kelvin as your answer. And just to make sure you should have gotten Kelvin, let's go through and make sure the units cancel out. So your Delta E up here was in joules. So your joules, uh, will cancel out on the top and bottom. Where did we get this joules per Kelvin down here? Well, Boltzmann's constant is in joules per Kelvin. So we got joules divided by joules. And then our N values are unitless, or even if they had units, like if we included some sort of measurement for intensity, it would cancel out because we're dividing one intensity by the other. Um, and so then we're just left with one divided by one over Kelvin. So this Kelvin is in a denominator, which is in a bigger denominator, which means that it will flip back up to the top here. So our temperature will be 375 Kelvin. All right, so now in this problem, I've just asked you to calculate the temperature from a bunch of given data. Um, but I could also ask you what would be the relative intensities of these two wave lines at a given temperature. And then all I would really have to give you is the actual wave numbers of the two lines and the degeneracies. Um, and then you could figure out this ratio of N star to N zero, or I could give you this ratio of N star to N zero, or just give you their intensities. And I could give you a temperature and ask you to calculate the degeneracies or the relative degeneracies.
So I could really ask you to solve most values in this equation. So you should be able to understand this equation and be able to solve it for different variables. All right, now here's a fun little question for you. Assuming that there's only two electronic states for nickel, which is actually a horrible assumption, there's actually hundreds, usually can only access um, a dozen or so, or a couple dozen, depending on your temperature. But let's assume for now, for the sake of this question, that there's only two electronic states. At what temperature will all of the electrons be excited from your ground state up to your excited state? So when will all the electrons leave n sub zero to go to n star here. Well, think about that for a second. You can pause the video now if you want. But the answer is that it actually never happens. You can't actually excite all of your electrons to excited states just by heating it up. You can do it by some other methods, but that is a problem you'll run into or a situation you'll run into if you take physical chemistry. But why can we never get everything up into the excited state? Well, if you look at this equation, to get everything into the excited state, then this whole side over here would have to be a really big number. This e to this exponent, or this e to this power over here would have to get really big. But even if you take T, or your temperature, all the way up to infinity, you get up to infinity temperature, then this exponent over here actually only ever gets up to a value of one. So the higher you crank this temperature up, the closer this e to this power gets to one. So the practical result for that is for temperatures that are greater than your difference in energy between your two states divided by Boltzmann's constant. So if t is greater than delta e over k, then the ratio of electrons in excited states to ground states is actually just equal to the degeneracy of the excited states divided by the degeneracy of your ground state, which is pretty interesting. All right, let's move on now to ICP. No, that's not insane clown posse. It's the inductively coupled plasma. Now, inductively coupled plasmas, I think, are really cool. So these are just really hot flames. And let's talk about how we get them. So I'm gonna replace this picture with a schematic diagram here. So in this guy, what we have is we have uh, air flowing through one of these chambers. We have argon gas flowing through another one. And then we have your sample going through a third one. And I think I set all those back. So you'll actually have argon through this top one. You'll have air through second one in your sample will come in through the middle. Now that's not super important, but what, you, what is important is you have argon flowing through this coil of wires that I have diagrammed here. And in this coil of wires, we start with a spark. When we have a spark in there, that is sending a bunch of high energy into the argons, and that will cause the argon atoms to lose electrons, or at least some population of argon atoms to lose electrons. And then what we do is we apply what's called a radio frequency through this coil of water, wires. Now a ra radio frequency is another term for an alternating current. So we use radio frequency just because it's fun to throw in new words that are confusing for students. But this alternating current of electrons, uh, as that's going through, when you're sending a lot of electrons through, you have a high potential. But when you start pulling those electrons out, you lower the potential. And so basically, as you're alternating your current through there, you're having a high positive voltage and then a high negative voltage. And so now what we have are a bunch of free electrons we knocked off that, those argon atoms. And we have a bunch of argon plus ions in there. And so as we're alternating that current, sometimes the argon is plus is attracted to these wires, sometimes it's repelled by them, depending on whether the voltage on these wires is positive or negative, whether our current is high or low, etc. And so that's also going to be causing the electrons to fly around in there. So now what you have is a sea of electrons and argon ions that are moving at a high velocities, either towards or away from that wire. And while they're moving, they're colliding with other argon atoms 
that are neutral, and when they hit the neutral argon, they have a high probability of knocking more electrons off. So this is very similar to what's happening in a photomultiplier tube, where you just have charged species being accelerated by a potential colliding into other things and or knocking electrons off. Now the amazing thing about this is while we're doing this and causing all these collisions and creating this really high flame by doing this, we actually get really high temperatures. So up here at the tip of this flame, right around here, we actually get a temperature of around 6,000 Kelvin. Now to put that temperature into context, the surface of the sun is only about 5,778 Kelvin. As we get down into this coil area, you actually do get into temperatures around 10,000 Kelvin. And if we compare that to the sun's core, it's actually nowhere close. The core of the sun is at 15 million Kelvin. And that gets up into temperatures where you have to start the, asking the philosophical question of what does 15 million degrees Kelvin actually even mean? We're not going to worry about that though. Uh, either way, this is getting really hot and so it's able to excite most metals and most uh, materials into their excited states and so you get a lot of emissions. So once you get into those excited states again, your electrons have some probability of emitting light. This is a picture of the ICP that we have in the Benson building up on the fourth floor. And right here in this window is where all the magic happens. All this stuff in front, so this is actually just a sample tray, so you can load a bunch of samples in there and it has an auto sampler that'll pick them up, suck your solution in and shoot it into here. You can see this little coil right here. That is our metal coil where well, we'll be applying our RF frequency. And that is the same as an AC current where we're doing high potential, low negative potential uh, back and forth. And so your flame happens right here. And so your sample uh, is catching on fire and emitting light. And the light can get detected through this front detector or this axial detector or it has a perpendicular detector actually as well. And to make sure the flame doesn't go into this axial uh, detector, we actually have this device right here that shoots actually a really high pressure uh, flow of air right here that chops the flame off so it can't go in there. But anyways, you can detect a sample either uh, perpendicular to the flame or on axis. And if you're measuring on axis, you actually get much better sensitivity, but much worse precision. If you're measuring perpendicular, you get better precision, so a lot less uncertainty, but you can't detect as low of concentrations on this side. All right, so ICP. Is this an emission or absorption technique? How do you know? Well, the way you tell is that in atomic absorption, you need an external light source, right? You need some light to be absorbed by your sample. In atomic emission, the sample is the light source. So if you're just measuring the light being given off by the flame, then it's atomic emission. If you're sending another light or laser through the flame, then it's atomic absorption. All right, some pros and cons for ICP. Well, the pros are that you can actually analyze multiple elements at the same time. So once you collect the light that's being emitted from that high temperature flame, you can send that light through a monochromator, and that monochromator will select out your different wavelengths of light corresponding to different elements and the spacing between electronic states and those different elements. And then you can also detect elements at very low concentrations. So ICP is really, really sensitive. The cons are it is more expensive than flame AA or the graphite furnace. And it actually happens to be less sensitive to alkali metals than flame AA. So it's more sensitive to just about every other species than AA, but it is still less sensitive than in the AA for your alkaline metals. But you can actually overcome that limitation if you couple this ICP with a mass spectrometer. 
and we'll again get into mass spectrometers towards the end of the semester. But ICP plus mass spectrometry gives you super sensitive detection. Um, but it's not actually an atomic absorption or atomic emission technique. All right, so to bring us back to the question we started the lecture off with, uh, if we want to know if there's lead or chromium in your honey, well, you'll send this through an ICP, and that's actually what some researchers did. I have the reference for their work down here. And they sent some candy, they dissolved it in acid, and then sent it through an ICP, and they actually found chrome, nickel, copper, zinc, lead, and pesticides in pretty much every piece of candy that came from Portugal, Spain, actually was made in the US, England, and Chile. So I don't know that they actually proved that the heavy metals and pesticide were from the honey. It likely was, especially the pesticides, but it could have been from other sources. So they really need to test the honey that these different companies are using to add into their candy. But the takeaway, home, or the takeaway message is that a lot of candy has heavy metals and pesticides in it. So that's exciting. And now here's just a one last cynical clip from the Dark Knight. Thanks, Alfred. <laughs> I like that clip. All right, we'll finish this lecture off with a practice problem. So this was a problem I used to give on exams and students kept getting mad at me because pretty much everyone would get it wrong. I thought it was a great question um, because it really tests your smarts. But uh, this is the question. Researchers are trying to identify an unknown using ICP. So here's the spectrum that we collected with or for the unknown using ICP. The spectrum for this unknown and reference spectrum or spectra for sodium and calcium are also attached uh, with the labels for their different emission wavelengths. These spectra were all taken back to back same day. What can you determine about the composition of the unknown sample from these spectra? And be sure to explain your answer. Now I'll start with why people got this wrong. People would get this wrong because they'd look at this uh, emission line at 585 and say, hey, that's really close to this emission line for calcium that's also at 585. And then they'd say, hey, sodium has two emission lines, and our unknown has two emission lines. They're all around 588. I mean, this is down to 587. And this one's at 589. This one's down to 588. I don't know. Maybe all these guys are slightly different than these because the solvent is affecting where the wavelength is showing up. And that's where the downfall comes. Because in ICP, the solvent doesn't matter at all. We're burning it to kingdom come. And so it is having no effect on the wavelengths that we're seeing here. So this wavelength at 585.7452 that we get for calcium is different than the wavelength you get for 585.24879 for our unknown. And that means that these are not the same emission lines. So our unknown, we can say, is not calcium, or at least we can say the calcium is at such low concentration that we're not seeing an emission line for it. Similarly, these sodium lines here at 588 and 587, those aren't the same wavelengths. So there's no sodium in this. And so everyone would get this wrong because they'd say, I think there's calcium and sodium. But really, this is just a spectrum collected for neon. Neon has very similar lines. But the great thing about this question, too, is it highlights the fact that if you had a sample with sodium and calcium in it and somehow got neon in there, I actually have a, or as an undergrad, I actually worked with samples uh, where we could get neon gas into the solution phase. We'd actually just trap it in a molecular cage. So it's a cage that would hold the neon in it and then it would, the cage would dissolve in the solvent. But so we could analyze that sample for all three of these species simultaneously. And we could actually see, we can actually separate this wavelength for calcium and this one for neon. And we'd be able to see all of these species and quantify them. So ICP is a really powerful technique. 
You can see multiple species at once. It's really sensitive and really selective. All right, if you have any questions about that, feel free to let me know. And that is the end of our lecture.